All right. So yes, this is the Trans Heroes Who Shake the U.S. by R.A. Reed. Um, I am not really someone with a degree in history or anything like that, but I do have my MFA is in creative writing. Um, I am also an artist. I'm taking online classes through the Milan Art Institute. I used to be the LGBTQ safe space trainer and the co-founder, I'm sorry, the founder and also a co-trainer of the Trans LA program at Fresno City College. Um, I also founded and was the first ever president and also, I guess, the second ever president um, of the Rainbow Alley Staff and Faculty Association at Fresno City College. And I am currently a board member of Trans Emotion, a transgender nonprofit support advocacy and resource organization here in the Central Valley of California of the United States. So a lot of people ask during um, history months like this, because right now, in the U.S., it is trans. It's a, it's a LGBTQ History Month, um, which for me being a trans artist means it is Trans History Month specifically because that is my shtick. Um, so a lot of people will ask, you know, why why do we have these History Months in the U.S.? Like, what's so important about this? Um, you know, why isn't there, you know, um, white straight History Month or something like that? And the reason for that is because people who are white and straight and cisgender are already um, being taught to us in public education. What we don't get from public education is any sort of education on people who are queer, people who are transgender, people who are gay, people who are intersex. A lot of people don't even know the word intersex. So that's where these kinds of months come into play. We encourage the community to seek out the education themselves during these times and also to provide the education to others. Um, so as this quote from uh, the Fresno EOC LGBTQ sanctuary says, the queer community is the only community worldwide that is not common. It's a cultural history at home in public school. Now, during, um, a lot of people also ask, is uh but isn't gender like gender diversity and gender variance a new thing um, a lot of people sort of think that trans people are like a new development um, but the reality is that queer people have always existed from the start of time from the first human beings we were there too um the thing that is is safety the ability to be trans, um, visibly trans or queer, um, which is something that is still a work in progress because it's still not very safe to be um, an openly queer person. Um, terminology, the ability to name the fact that we are queer, for instance, um, just you know, the fact that we even have words to describe us, that we have pronouns, um, those are new. And the ability to medically transition is also new. But just because it's new doesn't mean that it is unworthy of respect. Um, and those are the only aspects about us that are new. The fact that we have existed is not a new concept. Now, during this presentation, you might find yourself thinking that some of these people aren't necessarily heroes because they didn't do anything of very big consequence. But it's important to remember that being gay or transgender has always been criminalized. It's hard to change the world or even get a job when everyone who encounters you or discovers your identity responds with fear, disgust, and loathing. It's true that well-behaved women rarely make history. It's also true that openly queer people rarely make rent. Due to the constant er er erasure of queer people and their doings from historical records, the rewriting, dead naming, and misgendering of any accounts of their existence, and the tendency for writers to excuse away their gender nonconformity it's very difficult to even find or confirm examples of queer figures throughout the history of almost every nation in the world. As another queer history artist, Rhea Brodell puts it, it requires reading between the lines because so much of queer history has been explained away as illness, romantic friendship, opportunistic cross-dressing or fraud, or is rewritten or censored to suit the time period. Therefore, in this presentation, while not everyone became famous during their days or afterward or made a very bold impact on the society around them, I hope you'll still see their lifelong labors as impressive 
given the difficulties they had to overcome just because their sex differs from that of other people with the same gender. Sorry, I got carried away and forgot to actually like keep going on with my slides. <laughs> I will just start talking sometime. Um, do I have any questions about anything that I've said so far? You're all following well, following along pretty well. Okay, so I want to mention, I want to describe the word two spirit because a lot of people, even here in America, don't know that word. Um, so in case I do use that word, I want you all to know that that word means um, it's sort of a pan uh, indigenous word meant to describe uh, Native American people who fulfill a traditional third gender ceremonial and social role in their cultures. Uh, it's basically described as having both a masculine and a feminine spirit. And this term is sort of an umbrella term, kind of like how the word queer can mean people who are gay, people who are trans, excuse me, um, anything like that. Um, the word two-spirit is used to describe sexual orientation, gender identity, or polyamorous relationships. So if I don't have any questions, I'm going to start going over some historical figures. Um, I'm going in a sort of uh, chronological order, but I say sort of because some people live shorter lives, some people live longer lives. A lot of people, a lot of these people were alive at the same time. Um, so it's, it's sort of chronological-ish <laughs> um, for the most part. Uh, so the first person I want to talk about is Oshchish. Oshchish was a bade, a male-bodied person who lived according to the female role in the Crow community and was accepted as a woman. Earning the name Finds Them and Kills Them in a Fight Against the Lakota, Oshchish was a revered tribal member who owned a lodge, had a family, and was considered a leader. She was also an artist with incredible sewing skills. She made the Crow Chief Iron Bowls uh, Buffalo Skin Lodge. By the 1880s, missionaries began attempting to white manize the crow. Obsessed with the code of religious offenses, a moral directive which forbade non-Christian spiritual practices, they began persecuting natives over their dating and marriage traditions, which were very different from the Christian European standard of lifelong heterosexual monogamy. Throughout the 1920s, tribal members who refused to abandon their body traditions were penalized, imprisoned, and murdered, and their family treaties rations were cut or denied. It wasn't long before Oshchish and other two spirits became the target of the code and were imprisoned. But the Crow chiefs and the warriors spoke out in support of two spirit values. They pushed hard um, against the U.S. federal agents, ultimately gaining the body release. However, the later genocide and destruction of Crow culture by the colonists forced future bodies to live in secrecy or to die, leaving Oshchish to become known as the last body for many years. Next up, we have Lozen. We don't really know when Lozen was born. We, we believe maybe sometime in the 1840s. Um, we just know when Lozen passed away. Um, so again, like I said, this is a presentation in chronological-ish order, but it's also kind of hard to, to do that when I don't know, when we don't really have records as to when some people were born. Um, but okay, so Lozen, um, so that gives you some background to understand um, Lozen's history. For 30 years, um, up until um, the time that Lozen became well known, the U.S. Army had been attempting to capture Geole, which uh, who was mo more widely known by the name Geronimo. Uh, he, he was a prominent Apache leader and medicine man. Lozen was one of Geronimo's fiercest warriors, whose skill of military strategy was apparent from an early age. They were also a medicine woman gifted with powerful visions. After their brother was murdered by the U.S. Army, a distraught Lozen gathered four other Apache women and fought back, killing many and taking on the male role as a warrior. In the 1880s, the U.S. Army negotiated the surrender of Geronimo and his people. Many Apache were sent to Florida to live out the rest of their days in confinement at Fort Marion. 
Lozen unfortunately died of tuberculosis while imprisoned in Alabama, never returning to their homeland. You may also notice that during this presentation that I use pronouns interchangeably. Sometimes I didn't know whether they preferred to be called he or they or she. And so sometimes I use interchangeable pronouns according to the ones that most closely represent the gender roles that they chose to live in um, or according to the names that they chose. Uh, but most of the time in this presentation, I'm going to try to use they just because I can't speak to these people, so I can't confirm that they actually would have chosen a binary pronoun. So the next person I'm going to talk about is, is Dateste. And Dateste was also, I don't really, I can't find any records as to when Dateste was born. Um, just Dateste was believed to be about the same age as Lozen. Um, but if that is true, then that means Dateste lived to be like 110 years old. So I don't really know how accurate uh, the belief about uh, their birth year is, but we're just going to go with what we what we do think we know, which is that they may have been born in the 1840s. Um, the test day was a really, uh, has, a, has a much happier um, story outcome. So no one aided Lozen's campaign against the U.S. Army like the test day. The test day was a scout, messenger, and mediator. They were married and fought alongside their husband and their battle buddy, Lozen. The test they spent eight years as a prisoner of war at the Fort Marion after um, everything went down and 19 years at Fort Sill in Oklahoma. But after like 27 years of being imprisoned, they were finally released and relocated to Whitetail on Mescalero Apache Reservation in New Mexico. They owned many sheep a sign of wealth to many southwestern tribes, and had a hired man to help keep them. They were often seen riding around in the reservation in a pickup, dressed in full regalia. They outplayed everyone in baseball and lived in peace on the Mescalero Reservation until their death in 1955. In a very different part of the U.S., uh, around the same time, we have Weebaw who was born in 1849 in what is today known as New Mexico. Weewa's father, I'm sorry, Weewa's mother was a member of the Donashwi clan, the Badger people, and Weewa's father was part of the Beechwe clan, the Dogwood people. Orphaned as an infant, believed to be the result of a smallpox epidemic, Weewa and their brother were adopted by an aunt. Though born male-bodied in person, uh, community members recognized from early on that Weewa demonstrated traits associated with the Wamana. In Zuni culture, Wamana were male-bodied individuals who took on social and ceremonial roles generally performed by women. They usually, though not exclusively, wore women's clothing and mostly took up labors associated with women. Wamana constituted a socially recognized third gender role within the tribe and often held positions of honor in the community. We well received some instruction specific to men, but largely trained under their female relatives, learning to grind and prepare corn, as well as crafts and ceramic pottery, many of which held ceremonial importance. We well became a skilled weaver, usually a male role, and was known for their blankets, belts, and sashes. We well was among the first Zuni to sell their pottery and textiles, helping to bolster native arts more widely during a time when those kinds of things were being heavily attacked and destroyed. Weewa was also mastered, Weewa also mastered the tribal tales and stories that were part of the Zuni rituals. And if you're not familiar with them, those take a long time to even recite and to memorize them and to fully like embrace them and like embody them and recount them in that way is, it takes a lot of skill. During Weewa's childhood, the Zuni lived under the threat of Navajo and Apache raids. As a result, they relied heavily on diplomacy, allying themselves with the Americans through the 1850s and 1860s for security. In the 1870s, Anglo and Hispanic herders began to encroach on Zuni lands, and Protestant missionaries began attempting to forcibly convert the Zuni to Christianity. In late 1885, Weewa went to Washington, D.C., the U.S. national capital, for, for those who don't know, uh, for six months to foster cultural exchange and generate interest in U.S. anthropological research in Zuni culture. Even presenting President Glover Cleveland at the White House with a handcrafted wedding gift. 
We were also assisted with ethnographic research for the Smithsonian National U Museum, explaining the difference of Zuni artifacts and posing for photographs to document Zuni weaving and donated crafts to the museum's collections. As thanks to Weewa's efforts, Zuni became one of the well-known Indian tribes among the Americans in the 1880s. But unfortunately, the U.S. Office of Indian Affairs still insisted on dismantling the tribal culture, including abandoning the recognition of Wamna individuals and forcibly colonizing the Zuni. Biwa crossed over in 1896 at the age of 49 as a result of heart disease. Biwa's early death was considered a calamity among the Zuni, as Biwa left a profound legacy as a ceremonial leader, cultural ambassador, and an artist who worked to preserve the Zuni way of life. A little bit later, we have Hosting Claw, born in a very different part of the U.S. Hosting Claw was a master sand painter, chanter, weaver, and healer. There are four genders in the Diné tradition, and Claw's gender, Claw's gender was Nodli Hai, or one who changes, an individual who exhibits the characteristics often ascribed to the opposite sex. According to historical sources, Claw was believed to have been born intersex. Born in 1867, Claw lived in the Bear Mountain area, now called Fort Wingate, New Mexico. In their youth, Claw had a gift for traditional chant, which often took days to correctly recite. They learned weaving from their mother and sister and traveled across the U.S. to showcase these skills at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Claw single-handedly saved the Navajo weave, weaving tradition in the face of religious persecution. In 1921, they met heiress Mary Cabot, Wheelwright, and the two became close friends. Together, they formed the Wheelwright Museum of the American Indian in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Claw was integral in the museum's design, implementation, and curation, and even blessed its grounds. They passed away before the museum opened, unfortunately, in 1937. And around the same time, uh, actually a little bit before that, we have Albert Cashier, who was born on Christmas Day in Cloverhead Island. His stepfather dressed him as a boy so he could get a job to support the family after his mother passed away early in life. Cashier found his way to Illinois and the United States as a stowaway. And there he worked as a laborer, farmhand, and shepherd living as a man. In 1862, at 19 years of age, he enlisted in the 95th Illinois Infantry uh, in the Union Army of the American Civil War in Belvedere, Illinois. And for those of you who don't know or don't remember, uh, the Union Army was the army that fought for um, the end of slavery in the U.S. Uh, so in the Union Army, he served for three years before returning to civ civilian life. At least 400 females, likewise, uh, fought in the Union Army. We, as far as we know, as far as we can tell, we believe at least 400 females fought in the Union Army, most of whom were never outed, even after their years of service had ended, and lived the rest of their lives as men, making Albert Cashier merely one of the known examples of the hundreds of trans masculine people who fought to end slavery in the U.S. Some female body soldiers, including Albert Cashier, had relationships with other women. Many, like Cashier, were discovered to be biologically female only after their death when their bodies were prepared for burial. Um, so this person is Charlie Parkhurst. Um, Charlie Parkhurst was born in Vermont in 1812. Uh, Charlie Parkhurst was orphaned at a young age, and he and his siblings were placed in an orphanage that had a rather strict institutional environment. Parkhurst swiped the boys' clothing and ran away and worked in a stable at Worcester and soon became an expert whip. He was fond of a six in hand, also known as a six horse team, earning him the name Six Horse Charlie. He took a job with the new California Stage Company and started running stage lines around the San Francisco Bay Area and the Sierra, Sierra foothills. Parkhurst also rounded up bandits and put them in prison himself. Parkhurst waged war upon the outlaws along the route of the Grass Valley stage, uh, according to Munson's Muncie's Magazine, I'm sorry, I, uh, Muncie's Magazine in 1901, quote, he was small, but full of nerve and resource. 
Once a robber halted him as he was lashing his horses through a mud hole that threatened to bog him down. Parker's whip was in the air when the robber sprang out of the bush. Down came the lash across the road, uh, across the road agent's eyes. I'm sorry, I think the magazine meant to say rogue agent's eyes. Um, the fellow was picked up a day later, utterly blinded, but they saved one eye so he could see well enough to pick jute during his time in San Quentin. End quote. After a horse kicked Parkhurst, causing him to lose an eye, he then earned the name One-Eyed Charlie. He spent, the, he spent his entire life as a renowned stagecoach driver until he retired due to rheumatoid arthritis and passed away from cancer in 1879. He was not discovered to be biologically female until after his death. And while we're talking about the Union Army, I also want to talk about William Cathy. So back in the day, if you were born to someone who was a slave, you were a slave, even if, um, so if you were born to a female slave, then you were a slave. Um, if you were born to a male slave, but a free woman, you were free. Um, so during the time of slavery, William Cathy was unfortunately born to a free man, but a free, to, but to a slave woman. So William Cathy was born a slave. It was also born under a different name, um, like the other individuals I mentioned, but I'm not mentioning the dead name of any of these people because they have already been dead named a lot throughout um, history. Uh, if you look a lot of these people up online, William Cathy, for instance, is one person who you will not be able to find them. You will not be able to find any stories that actually like go but call them by the name that they prefer to be chosen uh, to be that they prefer to go by um, their chosen name. You will only find them referred to by their dead name and also misgendered as well. So in this presentation, I chose to only mention their true name and the pronouns that I think they would have most likely gone by or by they, them pronouns. The William Cathy was born to a free man, but also a slave woman and was therefore a slave. And they, the nature of their slavery was that they were a house slave on the Johnson plantation near Jefferson City uh, in Missouri. As far as we know, William Cathy was the first African-American female to enlist in the army as a man. When the Union Army occupied their area, they enlisted in the 38th Infantry, a African-American segregated unit under their chosen name. And it's not clear whether or not they actually chose to enlist in the army or whether they were forced to, because back in those days, um, though the Union Army was fighting to and slavery, they also had a tendency to consider slaves to be contraband and tended to force them to work in their army to help them end the slavery of other slaves. So it was kind of a hypo hypocritical um, action on their part. So there's so we can't really say whether or not they joined voluntarily or if they were kind of forced to. Um, but anyway, um, it was only men who were forced to, to join the infant to actually join like as a soldier, uh, the female slaves tended to be brought in as cooks and nurses and fulfill other roles that they thought were more appropriate to women. But what William Cathy did do was they chose to enlist as a man and become a uh, soldier. So in the Union Army, they served a three-year assignment before health concerns, possibly resulting from smallpox, caused them to be examined by a medical professional who then discovered that they were female which caused them to be discharged from the army. They then worked as a cook at Fort, at Fort Union in New Mexico and married a man who later robbed them and tried to take off, but William Cathy had him arrested. They then moved to Trinidad, Colorado, where they worked as a seamstress and may have also owned a boarding house, but that is unconfirmed. In 1892, after losing their toes to neurology and diabetes, they did apply for disability pension, but were unfortunately denied, as many people of color tended to be, even despite their years of service in the Union Army. They passed away shortly after being denied a disability pension. We then have, around the same time, we also have Jean Bonnet. Jean Bonnet was born in Paris and moved to San Francisco with her family. Um, San Francisco is in California. Uh, so they moved to California, the United States, with their family as a part of a French theatrical troupe. 
By age 15, he would get in trouble for fighting and petty thievery, so he was placed in an industrial school in San Francisco's first reform school. As an adult, Bonnet was arrested dozens of times for wearing male clothing and frequently mentioned in the press for it. According to the papers, he, he, quote, cursed the day that she was born a female instead of a male, end quote. He was also quoted for saying, quote, the police might arrest me as often as they wish. I will never discard male attire as long as I live, end quote. Bonnet spent much of his time on Kearney Street and made a fairly good living by catching frogs and selling them to French restaurants in downtown San Francisco. Starting in 1875, he visited brothels and convinced the women to leave prostitution to form an all-female gang, which supported themselves by shoplifting. Keep in mind that there were not many ways for females to earn money in 1875 than to turn to prostitution or criminal activities because they were not allowed to work in any other capacity and would be denied no matter how hard they tried. Uh, so they support themselves through shoplifting. One of these gang members, newly arrived from Paris herself, was Blanche Benou or Budon. There's not much consensus as to which one was her last name, but her first name was Blanche. To keep Blanche safe from her ex-lover, Bonnet and Blanche moved to McNara's Hotel in San Miguel, just outside of the San Francisco area. But on the evening of September 14th of 1876, Bonnet was lying in bed waiting for Blanche when a shotgun blast through the window killed him instantly. Though it's unproven, it's believed that Blanche was the intended target, uh, not Bonnet, and that the shooter was either a jealous lover or a pimp uh, who was trying to kill Blanche to uh, make Blanche an example to the other girls. Uh, but regardless of, uh, of the, regardless, um, the woman of San Francisco's red light district came out en masse for Bonnet's funeral. And forget the, the drawing because this was uh, actually my first drawing of this whole series of, of even being an artist in general. Um, I'd made some doodles as a kid, um, but this was my first drawing in like maybe a decade of not drawing. So it, it's not that great, but I did my best. And we'll probably redo this one at a later date. Um, but this is my attempt to uh, to draw Sylvia Rivera. And I want to mention, um, for instance, in this one, um, this is not may not actually resemble what Jean Bonnet looks like. This is just um, my rendition be, uh, based on what little information we do have about Jean Bonnet. Uh, we do not have any photographs, um, just some uh, very vague newspaper sketches that I was working from. And so I just sort of re-envisioned what Jean Bonnet probably looked like. And with this person, uh, there were some, some drawings and then the drawings and paintings of this person that I could find were fairly light skinned. And if you look at the one photo, like actual photograph that we do have of William Cathy, um, they're very, very dark. They are very, very dark and much, much darker and looked much more um, African American than the paintings that were made of them. You'll notice if you ever look at the paintings that were made of them and then for the newspapers and other sorts of publicity, uh, they tended to make William Cathy look much more white than they were. And so I chose to darken them and change some of their features a little bit to match the photo, the only photo that we have, which is of them sort of turned to the side. Um, half of their face was concealed by a hat and they were just wearing plain slaves clothing. And um, there's not only their nose or their and their lips were visible. So that was the only features that I could really replicate with 100% um, authenticity. And the rest of that kind of had to use my imagination. Um, but this one is based off of an actual photograph. Uh, so this is Sil Sylvia Rivera, who some of you may already know of. Uh, Sylvia Rivera is uh, someone who's fairly famous for good reason. And uh, Sylvia Rivera was born in New York City in 1951 to a father from Puerto Rico and a mother from Venezuela. She was assigned a male at birth. But due to her father's absence and her mother dying by suicide, when Rivera was three years old, she was raised by her grandmother. 
Rivera began experimenting with clothing and makeup at a young age, but was beaten and bullied for doing so. She ran away from home at 11 and became a victim of sexual exploitation around 42 second, 42nd Street in New York City. Um, it, it was about this time. Um, it's, a, it's important to, to acknowledge that even though we are now talking about people who lived in 1950s, uh, in this time, it was still illegal for people in the U.S. to be gay or to wear clothes that were intended for the opposite sex. And it was common for law enforcement to still do things such as raid establishments for uh, looking for people who, uh, raiding establishments that were frequented by queer people, looking for queer people to arrest. Um, and so that's what they were doing at the Stonewall Inn. And they had been doing this many times. Um, you know, just breaking in, and if they, they if the residents couldn't bribe them to to go away, um, you know, if they couldn't come come up with enough money to not be arrested, then the police would go around and basically just arrest everyone in the place um, for being gay and or for being um, for being trans. Uh, so on June twenty eighth of nineteen sixty nine, during the latest in the series of police raids at the Stonewall Inn. Someone in the crowd threw a Molotov cocktail at the police. Uh, it's not confirmed who, we just know that someone did it, and that Sylvia Rivera was actually the person who threw the second one. She was sometimes misquoted as being the first person to throw something at the police, but she was actually the second person and does not know who the first person was. Um, but she threw the second Molotov cocktail, and that really instigated um, you know, throwing up both cocktails really instigated the first in a series of full scale uprisings, which are now known today as the Stonewall Riots. At the time, Rivera was only 17 years old. She was living on her own. She was in and out of jail for survival crimes, such as prostitution, and for gender based crimes, such as wearing women's clothing and impersonating a woman, which is the term that they use for the charges against trans people. During the riots, Rivera said that she barely went home or slept because she didn't want to miss a moment of the riots and the protests for human rights that were beginning during that time. She would ex excitedly exclaim, it's the revolution. I don't want to miss a minute of it. Unfortunately, the gay rights movement at that time, however, um, tended to exclude people of color and people who are transgender. Despite having incited the civil rights movement and subsequently doing a lot of work in the community for it, the gay rights activists still refused to let Sylvia Rivera speak at the gay rights protest. And when she took the microphone anyway, she would be booed off stage. There's actually uh, famous footage of that happening. The gay rights movement then went on to secure some basic human rights for US citizens on the basis of sexual orientation only. And for many years refused to recognize the contributions of trans activists of color, including Sylvia Rivera. But despite the transgender discrimination she faced in the gay community, Rivera did not give up. She and her friend Marsha P. Johnson, who I'll speak about in just a minute, established Star House, which stands for Straight Transvestite Action Revolutionaries. And later they established Trans House. Uh, these houses were homes that provided basic necessities and shelter to transgender people, especially people of color in need. Despite struggling with homelessness and substance abuse addiction, Rivera was continuously involved in civil rights activism and in charitable causes until her death at age 50 in 2002. During the few years before her death, the gay rights movement did eventually get around to recognizing their own discrimination and began to reconcile with Sylvia Rivera and began to be inclusive of the greater LGBTQ plus community, not just people who are white and gay. And you cannot talk about Sylvia Rivera without mentioning her best friend, Marcia P. Johnson. Born on August 24th of 1945 in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and assigned a male at birth, Johnson grew up in an African-American family. Her father worked on the General Motors assembly line in Linden, New Jersey, and her mother was a housekeeper. Johnson grew up in a religious family and was a practicing Christian throughout her life. Johnson enjoyed wearing clothes made for women, and starting at age five, uh, she began being extensively bullied and sexually assaulted, and immediately after graduating from Thomas A. Edison High School, Johnson moved to New York City with a bag of clothes and $15. Once in New York, Johnson adopted the full name Marcia P. Johnson. The P stood for Pay It No Mind, 
a phrase which is now known as her motto. Due to gender-based gender discrimination in every workplace, it was really difficult back then for women like Sylvia Rivera and Marcia P. Johnson to find employment, forcing them to turn to sex work to survive. Johnson was often abused by clients, arrested by the police, and was often homeless, sleeping at friends' homes, hotels, restaurants, and movie theaters. Not long after moving to New York, 17-year-old Marcia P. Johnson met 11-year-old Sylvia Rivera, and the two became instant friends. Rivera described Johnson as, quote, she was like a mother to me, end quote. Johnson encouraged Rivera to love herself and her identity. Johnson adored wearing colorful outfits that she made from finds at thrift stores and discarded items, and she was also seen wearing a crown of flowers. And just to show you an example, here is a limited edition version of my drawing. This is a art print um, and on which I painted a uh, crown of flowers to, as a as a homage to what she would often do. Uh, when Johnson arrived at the Stonewall Inn on June 28th of 1969, she said the place was already on fire. The, there were many competing stories about exactly what it was that Johnson did during the raid at the Stonewall Inn, but the one thing that is clear is that she was on the front lines. The first gay pride parade, which today is an annual U.S. tradition in June, where every year in June we continue to have parades and festivals. Um, all of that began in 1970. Marsha P. Johnson was involved with both the organizing of the parties and the more radical Gay Liberation Front and the more moderate Gay Activist Alliance. But both organizations became dominated by white gay men who excluded and discriminated against LGBTQ people of color. For that reason, she helped Sylvia Rivera found Star House uh, which is in the back of an abandoned truck in Greenwich Village. Um, Star House then moved to a dilapidated building, which they tried to fix up, but the group was evicted after eight months. Um, Transy House was something that did actually get to live on for a good number of years. Throughout the 1970s, Johnson became a more visible and prominent member of the gay rights movement. She began performing the drag group Hot Peaches, she attracted the attention of many, including the pop artist Andy Warhol, who included her in a series of prints in 1975 entitled Ladies and Gentlemen. She fought continuously for many years for LGBTQ rights. Despite her joyous personality and ever-present smile, Johnson experienced mental health breakdowns and spent time in and out of psychiatric hospitals. She also continued to engage in sex work, not knowing any other way to make money. I mean, there really weren't other ways for, for trans people to make money back then uh, due to the rampant employment discrimination, and so she continued to also get arrested. In 1990, Johnson was diagnosed with HIV. She spoke publicly about her diagnosis and how people with the disease should not be uh, stigmatized and that people should not be afraid of people who have the disease. On July 6th of 1992, Johnson's body was found in the Hudson River. She was only 46 years old. Despite the obvious appearance of foul play, the police refused to investigate her murder, and many press outlets did not cover her death. At her funeral, hundreds of people showed up at the church. In fact, it was so crowded that people stood on the street around the corner. In 2019, New York City announced Marsha P. Johnson, along with Sylvia Rivera, would be the subjects of a monument commissioned by the Public Arts Campaign called She Built NYC. The first monument in this, this monument was the first monument in New York City to honor transgender women. In 2020, New York State named a waterfront park in Brooklyn for Johnson. Johnson is also now the subject of many documentaries and remains one of the most recognized and admired LGBTQ advocates today. And I just wanted to share this drawing that I made recently of the protests that were happening after the Stonewall riots. And as you can see on the left side of the screen, at the, at the very far left, you see Sylvia Rivera, and right next to her holding the umbrella is Marsha P. Johnson. You could always see the two of them together in a lot of the photos and documentation that we have from that era, and um, so you, you'll very often see them together. Sometimes you see them separately, but a lot of the pictures, they're together because they were best friends. And the last person I want to go over is Miss Major Griffin Gracie. 
uh, born in Chicago in the 1940s. She is unsure of her exact birth date. She was assigned male at birth. Griffin Gracie grew up with her parents and her sister Cookie and always felt that she was a girl. As a teenager, she met an older drag queen named Kitty who helped her dress up and taught her how to put on makeup. After coming out, her family rejected her and her sister Cookie even burned pictures of her. Miss Major graduated from high school when she was only 16 years old and enrolled in college, but was expelled from wearing dresses. After being expelled from yet another college for the same reason, Miss Major moved to New York City in 1962. She had to make money as a sex worker and considered it to be a profitable and pleasurable line of work. In New York City, Miss Major got involved with drag shows and started performing as a showgirl. Miss Major was at the Stonewall Uprising, which is often credited as the start of the LGBTQ rights movement, as I mentioned earlier. But Miss Major insists that activists were doing this work long before Stonewall, especially transgender women of color, but that Stonewall basically brought attention to their activities. In 1970, Miss Major was arrested for robbing one of her customers while working as a sex worker. She was convicted and sent to Sing Sing prison. After several months, she was released on parole. But when she wore light makeup to a meeting with her parole officer, just a little bit of eyeshadow, he sent her back to prison for breaking her parole. This time, she was sent to Denimara prison. Correction officers at Denimara prison tried to break her spirit. She said she first lived in the mental health in the mental hospital portion of the prison. The officer shaved her hair, even her eyebrows, and made her walk through the prison naked. In this prison, Miss Major met some of the leaders, however, of the 1971 Attica Prison Uprising, who influenced her political co consciousness. After her release from Danamora, Miss Major returned to working as a drag performer and helped many performers enter the profession, earning her the nickname Mama Major. She has also spent her life helping many rejected LGBTQ youth gain access to homes, education, and other resources. The spread of HIV and AIDS ravaged the LGBTQ community in the 1980s here in the U.S. and in many other places as well. And religious communities stigmatized the LGBTQ community for it. So Ms. Major began working in HIV protection and outreach and became an active activate, advocate, sorry, um, advocate and an educator with the Tenderloin AIDS Research Center, also known as TARC. She also started street clinics to provide HIV prevention out in the community. In 2004, Ms. Major joined the TGI Justice Project. It's the only organization in the United States that is dedicated to assisting trans people of color in prisons. She visited prisons on a bi-monthly basis to support incarcerated transgender people and is currently an advocate for the safety of transgender prisoners who are, at, who, if you don't know, are at especially high risk of being a victim of physical or sexual violence while incarcerated. To this day, Miss Major is still alive and she lives in Arkansas with her partner, Beck, who identifies as a transgender man and who gave birth to their first child, Isaiah, in 2021. And I also have a lot more people that I will be uh, drawing and painting. So please, if you aren't already, please uh, follow me on Instagram or um, you can check me out on my website, follow my newsletter. Um, I will be, I have a lot more people in mind that I'm going to be painting and drawing um, to continue to draw, bring attention to uh, trans figures from history. And these are the references um, for this presentation. And some more of my references are mentioned on the next page uh, here under my resources for further learning, um, because I think that they would also be great books for many of you who are, if you have any interest in learning more about trans history, these are fantastic books for learning about transgender history. Uh, and also I recommend Rhea Brodell. She, they are a artist who is basically doing the same kind of thing that I'm doing. Um, they have a whole series called Butch Heroes, which is just uh, historical paintings done in a really cute historical style of queer people throughout history. Um, I believe their their uh, art collection is a bit more inclusive of people who are um, who may not be trans but are like lesbians, for instance, um, and other queer people. Um, so it's a little bit of a different scope whereas I only paint and draw people who are trans. Um, so, but they, but they make really cool paintings that are full, 
really cool. So I recommend checking them out at riobodell.com. So, um, so this is my Instagram and also my website. So if, if any of you have any interest in following along as I continue to find and um, share the stories of trans people from our history, um, please feel welcome to follow me. And I'm going to also pause here and ask if any of you have any questions or if there's any feedback or anything that you want to say about the presentation.